My life as a hermit is slowly coming to an end. This film is about restoring the front brakes, including the fabrication of self-made brake lines and the refill with new brake fluid. And yes, I'm not kidding you. I really bought flowers for the day she'd go out again. With the disassembly of the tapered roller bearing, eventually I live up to the name of the channel. The bearing as such is perfectly okay, but yes, replacing the disc means you have to tear it apart. Today's cars are designed more efficiently in this respect. But this aluminium wheel carrier, I mean, look at it. It's such a beautiful piece of engineering. And I guess that the adjustment of a wheel bearing back in the 60s, it could be done by the gas attendant. Doing this sort of local paintwork with a minimum of masking effort is not a thing I can recommend. Over the years I have developed a good sense of where the overspray will go, but the internal algorithm to position the gun takes away much of the concentration I'd otherwise use for the actual painting. The bearings are good, but I wanted some of the dirt on the wheel carrier to go away. And so I had to avoid that loads of dust and brake cleaner go into the bearing. I've seen pictures on the web of guys who make this part look like a piece of jewelry. And under normal circumstances I would have done that too. But all kinds of blasting and heavy wire wheeling require the bearing to go out and springs around the corner. So for once I decided to accept to not restore this like a maniac, but like a normal friendly person.
Adjusting this wheel bearing means turning the clamp till no more play appears. The tricky thing is sensing if there is any play. Play in the wheel bearing can only be detected in vertical direction. In horizontal direction, one only feels the play in the countless parts of the steering. I also made the experience that using the discs to wiggle offers too little leverage to find out what is really going on. I suppose that's why some sources on the internet say that if this little disc can still be moved around, just a hint, the tension is okay. Frankly, I doubt this is a good way of doing it. Obviously, the disc's lateral movements not only depend on the normal force, but also on the friction coefficient. And that depends on the amount and kind of grease, surface roughness and whatnot. Accordingly, when two weeks later I had the wheel on, I suddenly did send some play that escaped my attention before. Eventually I turned the clamp further with little steps till all play was gone. And altogether, I guess, I ended up tightening it by about one-eighth of a turn from where I started. In the next film, by the way, you're going to see a man boldly going where no man has gone before, in the cavities of my 911 to protect and preserve them. I'd like to kindly suggest to you guys to sign up to my channel, because I'm sure this film is going to save you a penny on the long run. If you like my projects, it would also be great if you could recommend the channel to petrol heads like ourselves. Now you know that I listen to Taylor Swift. If you want to make your own brake lines, there are cheap and reliable tools available everywhere on the web. You only need the lines, the fittings, a cutter, a bending tool and the actual flaring tool. It's so easy, reliable and such a satisfying work. Sometimes I have the choice between going out with girls or doing some flaring and I hardly ever opt for the girls. The basic concept is to firmly clamp the line into the tool and then do some cold forming with a stamp that is pressed against the line.
At this point, people normally say that brake fluid, unfortunately, is hygroscopic and therefore it needs to be changed regularly. But guys, it's a feature, not a bug. If the brake fluid wouldn't absorb water, there would soon be water drops in the system that are corrosive and that would freeze and clog the lines. So if someone offers non-hygroscopic brake fluid to you, I suggest you decline. The device I'm using here consists of a pressure accumulator and a hand pump and a reservoir to be filled with brake fluid. Once used brake fluid is allowed to escape at the other end, the system simply pushes fresh one into it. And that's all. Except one thing. You see, back in the 80s brake fluid included substances that resolved paint. I remember it like yesterday when little greasy fingers used brake fluid in the family's bathroom to strip the paint of his model cars after I created runs and fingerprints. Quite uniquely, Porsche therefore provided their cars with a hose that would conduct the overflow into the open. It needs to be disconnected, otherwise it's not possible to pressurize the system from here. I am sure there are more professional tools to do this, but the method with the tongs does the job, as long as the zip tie doesn't slide off. Once the system is pressurized, one starts opening the drain plug at the caliper most distant to the booster. Doing a first time refill, first comes air, then fluid with bubbles, then pure brake fluid and once this point is reached I let it drain for a bit more to be on the safe side and then close it off. This is repeated four times step by step approaching the booster. When everything is said and done, there's going to remain a little too much brake fluid in the reservoir, which has to do with the way intake and outlet are arranged. Friendly enough, Ate have designed the level sensor in a kind of char that can be used to take out the excess. It's by the way Ate, not ATE or RTE. At least this is how the company's employees pronounce it. <laughs> 